Welcome to the Tiny Tiger Lecture Series, a compact collection of martial arts studies research brought to you by rhetoricalroundhouse.com. Last time we discussed the fundamental ways in which martial arts can be described as rhetorical. Today, we'll look at three American boxing icons as examples for how martial arts can produce rhetorical effects on audiences. In his 1945 book, A Rhetoric of Motives, Kenneth Burke noted that one of the foundational concepts underlying rhetoric is identification. Essentially, if you understand a speaker to be similar to yourself or something familiar, you are more likely to be hospitable to a discussion or exchange of ideas. Of course, if you cannot identify with that speaker or their chosen means of communication, you might react quite negatively to the argument proposed. Take the example of Jack Johnson, the first black boxer to win the world heavyweight title, as an example of what happens when a rhetorical actor fails to facilitate the kind of identification Burke describes. Fighting for the belt in 1908, a time when science and law supported a political system which declared him genetically inferior to whites, Johnson found difficulty in even getting a shot at the title. It took Johnson nearly two years of public taunting and stalking champion Tommy Burns across the globe before he was finally accepted as a challenger. Johnson unequivocally destroyed Burns in a one-sided contest, but the final moments of the fight were never recorded because police feared the public outcry. You can see the blistering attack. Burns was absolutely defenseless just seconds before the police stopped the motion picture cameras and entered the ring to halt this very one-sided fight. The thought of a white champion losing to a Negro boxer was a fearful idea, one the New York Times summed up by saying, if the black man wins, thousands and thousands of his ignorant brothers will misinterpret his victory as justifying claims to much more than mere physical equality with their white neighbors. This quote demonstrates how black Americans, those who could identify with Johnson, held him up as a hero. But most whites, those who rejected his career and life choices as what Jeffrey C. Ward called unforgivable blackness in the Jim Crow era, saw him only as a source of rage. This was made clear after Johnson's 1910 victory over Jim Jeffries, the former champion billed as the Great White Hope. After his defeat, race riots broke out across the country, killing dozens and injuring hundreds. Johnson unloads a thunderous left, and Jeffries goes through the rope. A Great White Hope. Humiliated. Beaten. Betrayer of his race. Because of this backlash from white America, it would be 30 years before the world saw another black American heavyweight champion in Joe Lewis. But this was, in part, because of Lewis's strict rules for inside and outside of the ring designed to separate him from the shadow of Jack Johnson. These so-called good Negro rules included never taking a picture or fraternizing with a white woman, something that ultimately resulted in Johnson serving a prison sentence, and never gloating over an opponent in a fight. Ultimately, though, Lewis would never be able to have a white audience identify with him in terms of race, so he crafted an image around national pride. This was no more evident than in the 1938 bout between Lewis and Max Schmeling, a fighter billed as the German champion of Aryan superiority. Before the fight, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt elevated the severity of this contest by reportedly telling Lewis, Joe, we need big muscles like yours to defeat the Germans. And defeat them he did. Lasting only two minutes and four seconds, the fight was over before Schmeling could throw more than three punches. and boxing fans black and white rallied around Lewis as a champion of the free world. It turns out that Americans didn't care about the color of the fist so long as it was punching a Nazi in the face. But there's a problem with this moralistic narrative, of course. Joe Lewis wasn't a real-life Captain America any more than Schmeling was a cartoon Hitler. Not only did Schmeling refuse to call his defeat the result of a foul, as the German propaganda machine encouraged him to, but he later housed Jewish refugees during Kristallnacht at the risk of his own life. Max Schmeling helped my father and myself at a time where he had no benefit. My father was not a rich man anymore. Everything was taken away from him. There was nothing this man could gain. If this wouldn't have happened that night, I wouldn't be here tonight. It's important to remember that these fighters are real people and participants in multifaceted, complex arguments about race, politics, and society, not the kind of predictable tropes we'd find in a Rocky movie. Two guys killing each other. But I guess that's better than 20 million. What I was trying to say is that if I can change, and you can change, everybody can change.
On the one hand, fighters often naturally invite rhetorical identification or rejection from viewers, as we've seen with Jack Johnson. On the other hand, managers, promoters, announcers, and other media outlets construct artificial narratives about fighters for ulterior motives, as with the propaganda surrounding Joe Lewis. But no single fighter resisted either of these rhetorical strategies more than the most iconic heavyweight in boxing history, a man who won his title as Cassius Clay, but his fame and notoriety as Muhammad Ali. Challenger from Louisville, Kentucky, Cassius Clay. Another jarring right hand that time, folks. Another one, Sonny Wobble. Sonny Wobble. Cassius has him hurt. Got the mark on the face. Yeah. And an upset son in this one. And I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. After his stunning upset of Liston, Clay holds a press conference that would only amplify the shock factor. Somebody said, are you a card carrying member of the black Muslims? And he blew up. Clay confirms that he's a member of the Nation of Islam. He, and he said, I don't have to be what you want me to be. I'm free to be who I want. This is about as revolutionary a statement as I've ever heard in sports. Neither a saint nor a devil, but a strong-willed, free-thinking man, Ali took back the platform of the fighting ring as a rhetorical space for athletes and refused to let outside audiences craft narratives about race or religion for him, a sentiment we will explore next time as we look at examples of martial arts rhetoric in Asia. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe, or head over to rhetoricalroundhouse.com for more content. Thanks for watching, and check back soon for new videos. Kamsamida!